Hey folks, welcome to the Market Huddle Plus episode where a previous guest returns to the show for a quick update. I'm Kevin Muir and this week we welcome back Rupert Mitchell from Blind Squirrel Macro. We have a terrific discussion about the problems in private equity and private credit and then Rupert hits us with this new trade idea that you don't want to miss. It's our great pleasure to welcome back to the Market Huddle Plus episode Rupert Mitchell. Rupert is the author of the Blind Squirrel Macro newsletter and it's a pleasure to have you back. Hi Kev. Uh, I have seen your writing lately and I, I wanted to have you back because you've been talking about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is private equity, private credit. And uh, I saw the other day you became a, a big shot. Uh, Clifford Asnes retweeted one of your comments about private equity. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm not worthy. Truly not worthy. And I, to be fair, I mean, Cliff has been um, really on the money on this, and to be honest, he's got um, he's got to walk past these private equity guys when he goes to the grocery store every day. Um, so <laughs> that makes him a pretty brave dude. Um, I don't think he's lacking I, for I, courage. I don't think he's short of confidence either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I, you know, he has been on the case because you know, I mean, he coined the term volatility laundering, and. Um, you know, I think his his basic um, his basic complaint is that the private equity boys don't get judged by the same metrics as his funds do, which I think is fair enough. Um, and I guess um, I've been on the case since well before this time last year, and mercifully um, chose not to implement my negative view towards the private asset market sector via doing anything anything to do with the private equity shops themselves, the likes of Blackstone, KKR, Carlisle. Instead, I took the view that the first shoe to drop would be the intermediaries. So the, I mean, in my case, the, the Goldman Sachs um, intermediary business where, you know, ultimately there's going to be less M&A and capital markets work to go around. And, you know, that really played out pretty, pretty, pretty effectively over the course of this year. And, Last month, I was just gearing up because the the Goldman trade came off with the October expiration, and I was just gearing up to you know tackle um, the private e private asset market um, industry directly with some kind of structure on Blackstone, and then we had the risk rally that's basically rendered all short side activity virtually illegal in the last few weeks. <laughs> Well, if it's not illegal, it's definitely unprofitable. <laughs> it's definitely unprofitable. I mean, I, 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 I literally have virtually nothing on the dark side of my book at the moment. I don't know about you, but it's, 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 it's been a, it's been a terrible market to even contemplate fading. Right, um, but let, let, let's talk a little bit about the bigger picture, though, because yeah. to some extent, this is more than just one trade. This is a whole theme that you have, and I, I'm sympathetic to it and one of the things that kind of strikes me though is we're sitting here and you and i can say oh this is terrible you know they're not marking their books to market uh it's it's uh, you know volatility laundering as cliff uh, so aptly named um but yet and we can say it's going to end badly but yet it it keeps gaining assets yeah, I and mean, that's the part that just shocks me. I don't know. Are you surprised by that? Yeah, I was chatting with a mutual friend of ours yesterday about this, and um, this is Paul Craig, and he's been on the show, and he's working on um, um, a, a new um, a new venture within private assets right now, and he spends a lot of time with the allocators. And the reality is, is that um, there are two things here: one, um, time frame. Um, most of these investments are made on a three to five plus year view. Um, and so allocators will claim they're just not too worried about the interim marks. Um, and then the unsaid bit, which I think is much more powerful than anything else, which is that they don't want to be reporting volatility up to the people that they report to. And so it's a, it's a bit of a convenient truth. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, accusing any, anyone of, of, of subterfuge. But the fact of the matter is that um, numbers that don't move around violently are much easier to explain and get people comfortable with, particularly if you don't have a, you know, a supervised, a, 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 a super qualified um, group of people that you're reporting into. But I think... Right, but... Sorry, go know, ahead. Keep Finish your thought. 
Yeah, my my biggest issue is that, um, and you know, this was um, if you think about the run towards alternative investment, it all started in the late nineteen eighties with the Yale Endowment with David Swenson, and um, I came across this brilliant quote of his the other day where he said. Um, illiquidity is the unfortunate cousin of diversification, right? He went in to hedge funds and private equity when no one else of his ilk was doing that. And he was doing it for reasons of diversification. Now, most of the big endowments and big pension funds have massive allocations. So everyone's in on the same trade. There is no diversification from that perspective. And so all you've got left is the illiquidity. Well, and, and but can I interrupt? Because not only was there the diversification element, weren't you buying equity at multiples that were less than the public uh, markets? A- abs- absolutely, you were you were being compensated for your illiquidity with extraordinary, you know, valuation discounts. Right, so, and and, and so, it uh, made sense because if you're going to be in a stock for the next five years, you should be buying it at a discount. It's classic Buffett style margin of error, right? I mean, how how you know how wrong can you go if you buy a business on a five ten year view at three times cash flow? The trouble is right. they're paying eighteen times forward cash flow now. So this Adavinter LBO that I picked on in my Monday letter, this is a Norwegian headquartered but global online classifieds business, right? And this is so think job sites selling your car, you know, selling, selling, selling your home privately, that kind of, that kind of business. I mean, you know, it's definitely not the kind of business that necessarily flourishes in a, in a recession, but um, Blackstone and Pamira have led um, an LBO of this business. Um, they're paying a chunky premium to the undisturbed share price, but more importantly, they're paying 18 times forward cash flow. And they're putting $4.8 billion of debt on a business that currently generates cash of $500 million. I mean, I can't see how this is anything other than a, just a Hail Mary bet on falling interest rates. <laughs> and as you so rightly pointed out in your letter, there's a lot better ways to bet on falling yeah, interest exactly. rates. Yeah, exactly. Just learn how to trade stir futures. <laughs> That's right. Um, and, and there's all sorts of conflicts of interest in terms of the, yeah, the private I mean, that's, equity that's, and the that's private part debt of, that's portion. My, yeah, and, and I, you know, ultimately, this pro- whole private asset trade is, a, is, is, you know, is the redheaded stepchild of zero interest rate policies. Um, and, you know, we've kind of made the interest rate point here. But on top of, um, you know, when, when, when deal making becomes increasingly unnatural, Stranger things happens. So, getting back to this 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 Monday deal, not only is Blackstone leading the equity with Pamira, they're also leading the debt component, right? And this debt deal is pretty chunky. It's coming one and a half percent in terms of spread inside the latest jumbo LBO, which is in the US for a software company called Finastra, and you've literally got a cohort of. Everybody that's just raised a, raised a private equity fund, a private credit fund rather, and they're in this deal because they need to be seen to be doing something. Um, and I wrote in my letter that I had sort of a little bit of PTSD looking at that. I, I know what it's like to be on the buy, on the sell side when there's a deal drought going on. You sort of attach yourself to any any degree of activity, and the activity that we're looking at is, you know, a very big deal. But arguably, be arguably at a very full price, with way too much leverage, in um, in a sector that doesn't necessarily look bulletproof um, in the kind of economic climate that we're, that we look to be about to be going into. Um, and going back to this point about conflict, so you've got a highly levered debt deal. If you're an LP in Blackstone's credit fund, you are get, you've you've got this highly levered debt deal where if, frankly, when something goes wrong, you've got Blackstone private credit negotiating with Blackstone private equity about how to work out the situation. I mean, I you know, just it it just just feels problematic to me. One of the things that just kind of 
baffles me and, and it reminds me of the old, uh, I, I think it's a Warren Buffett line where he says the, what the wise man does at the beginning, the fool does at the end. And Brilliant. we go back to David Swenson and we talk about how originally that Yale endowment model was they bought private equity because you could buy um, equity at a discount to the public market and you hold it for a long time and you do well. And now it seems like they're actually paying premiums to own private equity or private credit so that they don't have to mark their books to market. And this just scares the bejesus out of me. And when I think about like, why do people keep investing in these private um, funds? And I'm just thinking at the end of the day, it's incentives. They want to be able to just continue to show minimal volatility. And yep. it's going to be one of these things that it's going to continue till it, um, it, until it doesn't. And one of the things that I'm grappling with is what does the end game look like for this? Well, I mean, I think the good news is that it doesn't look like 2008, 2009, because we're not talking about, you know, the U S housing market at the epicenter. Um, I think that ultimately there are going to be some very high profile, large deals that get zeroed and, you know, Whilst there are plenty of grown-ups and ultra and high net worth individuals that um, that put money into these funds, um, a lot of the money comes from public type money, whether that's the employee pension funds or university endowments. And at that point, I think is is when um, big P has a political problem. Um, they're already getting some attention for anti-competitive practices. I'm thinking sort of health. Healthcare, healthcare sector roll-ups and the like. Um, but I think when they actually start losing money for people that mind, um, then they then they have a political problem. Um, one of the things, though, that I, I might push back a little bit on is that although I agree that there is a lot of institutions in the market and that, mm -hmm. that is where the majority of the dollar value of the deals are getting done, this is a phenomenon that is definitely expanded outside of the kind of just big endowments. And oh, yeah, I'll tell you, yeah, yeah this is one of the things. Theory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, like if you just, I, I think if you go listen to your Bloomberg TV uh, you'll see, there'll be, uh, I, I can't remember there's, there's some sort of firm that's in, it's saying that uh, well, advertising. I get those ads. Yeah, yeah. 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 And there's, it's, it's no longer, is this just the, CalPERS or Ontario teachers buying from Blackstone, we're getting lots of kind of, you know, people that are worth a decent amount, but really don't know the markets. And they're wandering into these things because they see the allure of like what looks like a nice stable return and they're attracted to it. And I'm really worried actually that there's more of that going on than we imagine. I know when I talk to kind of people outside of the industry that have money and um, a lot of the people that I chat with are more trading oriented and they're more geared towards public markets, but then they'll talk about their friends and they'll say their friends will be like, why are you bothering with all that? I, you know, yeah. I owned this REIT, uh, private REIT and during COVID it didn't mark down once. And I'm just like the entire world re-rated in terms of interest rates, and yet these guys somehow managed to go through this whole period without marking down. Well, and they just, just they just clearly haven't asked for their money back yet, right? right? And this is and, this and is what scares yeah. me, and it, and it, and it really does scare me. And so, although I'm sympathetic to the argument that you know this is when you hear the sophisticated players talk about private credit, they'll be like, okay, there'll be some tranches maybe the 2021 tranche will do really bad but if you look at the 2023 we're asking for more covenants we're getting a better rate everything's going to be fine and over the long run it'll work out fine i i don't know it really feels to me that um there's a lot of people who don't understand it and that there's a lot of of things that when when people tell me not to worry about something i'm like no no that's actually the hallmark of a crisis like everyone thinks that they're going to call the next crisis in advance. And if everyone saw a crisis coming, it wouldn't be a crisis because we would have all adjusted for it. It's always yeah. the thing that you think can't hurt you that ends up hurting the worst. And it just seems to me that private yeah, equity, this is private a, this credit is bit, has, sorry, yeah, go this ahead. Ha 
this has all the hallmarks of the the, the you know the next big short syndrome, right? Yes. Which is yeah, everyone being early, and um, you know, as I say against myself, I mean, you know, if I had acted directly on this view a year ago, I would have lost a ton of money. Um, right. You know, you know, <laughs> yeah. Blackstone's up what? Let me have it. Last time I checked this morning, yeah, Black, Blackstone's up twenty twenty six and a half percent in the last year. KKR's up nearly 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 forty. Um, you know, I, I picked on the intermediary. Fortunately, they're down ten percent in the year. Um, but you know, these guys these guys have not skipped a beat so far, and um, you could lose a lot of money waiting for the right outcome to happen. Oh, I said right. Sorry, no, no. What you you were expected outcome, <laughs> <laughs> but so do you think that it has the potential of being uh, something that uh, is the next crisis? Um, I I think it I think it probably looks more like a slow puncture than a blowout, right? Okay, um, explain to me how you see that uh, occurring. I I think over time um, there'll be. That we've already seen the slowdown in deal flow, right? And then things like last week's out of inter LBO, you know, people aren't stupid. That does look like a a pretty risky a pre- pretty risky deal at a pretty full price. Um, you know, it's just all going to start smelling a little bit fishy. And I think that you could see a situation whereby just the excitement and the premium just starts to leak out of the market. You could see the the the, the big P shops start to dramatically underperform the market. And now, as we started at the beginning, I mean, you know, it's tough to have a um, an aggressively bearish views on markets, but I think um, right now. But once it turns, once we see a situation whereby it's going to take longer for people to get their rate cuts. Um, I think we see a period of protracted underperformance by by the big private equity shops, and that's and, what and, I'm looking to set myself up for next year. And and do you think it's uh, it's going to take a change in the economy for those to be, for it to be realized? Um, well, actually, the change in the economy could be the thing that bails them out. If things, oh God, I'm, I hesitate, hesitate before saying it. If things start to break. Right, and rate cuts come sooner than what is currently priced. You know, these guys could get a temporary stay of execution, and it would certainly be your your indicator to you know step aside from the trade for a while. You know, if we if we suddenly go into an emergency cutting cycle, you know these 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 guys probably survive for another half cycle. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm I'm still grappling with that because I, although I do understand the argument that bad news might be good news for them because it takes the pressure off of on the monetary side. Ultimately, I think they have too much debt for, and, and the, the loans they wrote were poor. And sure, if we go then, you need to, then you need to wait for the maturities, which really is a couple of years away. Okay. So it, it, it is, and is that just the same cycle that the public well, market is on? So, so what we're going to be dealing with next year is, all those smart companies that refinanced during COVID are going to be coming around to having to step up into the new rate environment, right? And that's not really pressure that's going to be exerted on the, pri- the private markets yet to the same extent. Um, this is the opportunity that all these private credit funds are salivating about, right? So they think they're going to step into the step into the breach um, that the, the, right. the, the I, public markets can't provide. You, you see all these things that they say it's the golden age of private credit is upon yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah. You know, listen, it's all very well if, if you know, there is some smart guy that's going to be lending senior secured debt to a high quality corporate at 12%. And those guys are going to make off like bandits. And for sure, like enough, Howard Marks yeah. is like, the, yeah, yeah. I guess that's the part that I think people don't understand. Howard Marks has gone and raised money. And yeah, maybe he's allocating some, but a lot of his powder is still dry. He's not sitting there with loans from 2020 and 2021. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. They're waiting for something. But, but the trouble is, you've got a lot of money that is already burning holes in pockets. And okay. 
very quickly that 12% senior secured deal becomes 11, 10 and a half, 10 and a quarter. Then you hit the, the, the single digit barrier. And, you know, there's always there's always a race to the bottom when there's too much money chasing the same opportunity. And I think that's what we've right. got. We've got a real crowding effect. You, I, and so you just think there's too much liquidity out there still. And ultimately, maybe that is why private credit, private equity is still doing well. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like absolutely. When you talked they, they, about they, originally, you said something about it being, a, you know, a byproduct of the 0% interest rate. Well, maybe it's actually a byproduct of the liquidity as opposed to the actual rate. Um, I mean, it's, it's tough to disassociate the two, to be honest. Um, you know, one, one, one is a derivative of the other to a certain extent, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, um, there is too much, much money chasing an opportunity that is, that is much smaller than people think. Um, but next, next year is, you know, you know, vanilla public debt deals that need to be refinanced, which these guys think they're going to step into the breach for. And, okay, so you, but, well, let's go back to your idea. You still think it's a slow puncture, meaning that we just get more and more kind of bad news and at the margin people start saying, hey, wait, this private credit, private equity wasn't as good as I'd hoped and the reality is they're uh, not absolutely, using absolutely. pencils. Yeah, there's that. Right, yeah. the deal, the deals patently just don't look as good as what was promised on the can. Right. Then there's two continued um, regulatory pressure, pressure div driven by populist politics on both sides. Where you know, to be honest, private equity has a lot to answer for in terms of um, the arbitrage of regulation in a number of sectors in the U.S. And um, when when people have to pay, you know you know, $2,000 to have their dog put down. Um, and they realize it's because every vet in a 400 square mile vicinity is owned by the same company start, um, you know, problems start to happen. Um, and is that true? I I'm, 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 I'm exaggerating for effect, Kevin, but I mean, I, I, I there's actually been, actually, actually it's been a real problem down here in Australia. If you, if you, if you need to go and see a 24 hour vet in Melbourne, um, yeah, it's the same company that owns pretty much all of them in the state. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> and you know, you know, a sick dog over a weekend can cost you tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, well, the uh, the the private equity guys, thank you for it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. So, um, ultimately, how do you play this? Do you think that these uh, private equity companies like the KKRs, the Apollos, are they just? Yeah. I mean, they're I, just I sales. Think I think I've 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 picked on Blackstone in particular because I I think that they are e exceptionally long on the real estate side where some of the worst excesses have happened in terms of the commercial real estate side. Um, okay. I um, but we're not ready yet. I mean, I, I I wrote the I wrote the first note as we were sort of trending down in October, um, and um, you know they've retraced what two thirds of the October fall already. Um, Ultimately, the broader market needs to be in a downtrend, at which point I think these guys underperform. Right. Because I was like, I'm looking at it on a relative basis. And although you're right, it stopped going down at the end of 2022, it's barely yeah. up versus the market. Like it's basically been a wash. Yeah. And yeah. so I guess you, if you're playing the relative game, you could say it's a sale. And if you're playing the absolute game, you're saying wait for the market to roll over. Absolutely. I mean, I certainly don't have a position yet. Um, oh, and as, and so Blackstone, a, because of the real estate exposure, you think is the most vulnerable? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's a, interestingly there's a there's an Invesco um, ETF um, ticker PSP, which is okay. basically a one stop shop for global private equity. Um, as a as a sort of delta as as um, you know as a as a sort of more diversified exposure to a general view, I think, you know, that short that against a, a, a long equity market position could make a ton of sense or just outright. Yeah. Well, this one actually is more, it is global. So you get a, it's not it's global. Just, it's global. Right. And if you think, if you think the U S firms are behaving badly, check out what they're doing in Europe. 
<laughs> Why are they are they worse? I can't believe well, that they're worse. I mean, you know, just just ultimately, there's um, you know, you've got domestic competition in every market. What's be always people in the U.S. forget about it is that um, you know. North America is kind of a hom- homogenous market with apologies to Canada. But I mean, it's, you know, ultimately when you, when you compete for a piece of private equity business in say France, as well as the global shops going for this deal, you've got two or three pretty powerful domestic shops. And so there's an environment where the likelihood of overpaying for an asset increases. You got see it. what I mean? I, I'm looking at this one on a relative basis against MSCI World, and it's definitely gone nowhere since you know the like it, it's it's worse a worse relative performer. So I think, I maybe, think it'd be I think it'd be an interesting way to play it. Yeah, no, actually, I like that a lot. All right, let's talk about something else. Uh, you said that you were going to go UK dumpster diving, and it wasn't going to be after a big night out at the pub. <laughs> Listen, I, 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 I'm anyone that knows me well knows that I'm still pretty grumpy about Brexit, um, and ultimately, um, you know, my natural dis- predisposition is to be pretty negative, sterling. And I know you're as bad as Canadians. Assets. Canadians I, I always know, hate their currencies, I, I, and like you're the Brits I, are the same way. Maybe it's because we can't get it from you guys. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it is, but. You know, I um, I mean, it's a bit like you and Bonds. I'm either um, I'm either flat or short sterling traditionally. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now, but you're at this point dumpster diving what in the equity market? Well, interestingly, um, the I mean, US, UK equity markets and domestic equities. I'm talking here, so I'm talking the FTSE 250 rather than the FTSE 100, which has a slug of global resource names and really isn't a really isn't a sort of a national index um, per se. But those those UK mid cap equities have basically done nothing um, in nine, 10 years. Um, if you look at, and I realize this is dangerous territory, but if you look at um, relative valuations versus the US, the you know, the Cape earnings or the KP gap has just widened and widened. Yeah, sure. US equities have outperformed the rest of the world in valuation terms. And that's not a unique thing to the UK, but it's pretty extreme when it comes to the UK. The UK has also suffered from the fact that basically since the change in regulation that created um, liability-driven investment, you know, the thing that created the real headache with the gilts market last year, Yep. has essentially driven UK pension funds out of UK equities. Um, the UK pension fund allocation to their own domestic equities, in many cases, it's kind of like sub 3%. I mean, you you really don't see any that anywhere else in the world, which means that the you know there isn't a natural institutional buyer base for UK equities. But I think we've we you know we've we've finally got to the end of of that cycle, um, and you know ultimately you have got a lot of very high quality businesses that are trading at um, very attractive valuations. Where you know arguably you know there there isn't anything worse that can happen to them. And <laughs> famous last words. By the way, I'm no, 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 but, 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 but I, but you know, I'm not. I'm listen. I'm not the only genius that's pointing this out. You can, you can clearly see that the the strategic and private equity led M and A in in UK mid caps is is accelerating. So, so I, have I got uh, the right index? Can, is it the MCX? Um, that's the, what, the FTSE 250? Yeah, yes. the FTSE 250. Okay, so, um, and I got this right, it's trading at 10 and a half times trailing earnings? Yes. Oh, holy smokes, and I'm like going back, and, and it was, what, between 12 and 22 for the decade yeah, it, before? It, exactly. And yeah, if you, so it's if, dirt I mean, cheap. If you, if you, if you, it, it, it is dirt cheap. Um, it's kind the, of almost Japan-like, small, small cap Japan yeah, levels. I mean, so, so I mean, you know, I like to, I, I like to sort of um, wrap option trades around, um, around yep. this. This is categorically not an option trade. Um, ultimately, what I'm, what I mean, you know, the, so the dirt cheap, the the private equity shops and the strategics are beginning. We've seen quite a lot of M and A activity accelerate literally in the last few weeks. What we've also seen is um, 
activism from Bose Weinstein, you know, the Southern Capital guy, who yep. is smart targeting, guy. very smart guy, yep. and he is targeting the the cottage industry that is UK investment trusts. Now, these are professionally managed, actively managed mid cap equity funds trading at like double digit discounts. Closed end funds that are trading at discounts. Closed end funds trading at discounts. So, do, you, do you have any of the ones that he's mentioned lately? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, and and actually, you can you can very easily jump onto the AIC website. Um, that's the um, this is a, this is the British Association of Investment Companies. Right, and yeah. they've got these brilliant screeners where you can screen for minimum liquidity, minimum market cap, and and for for a discount. So, and these are all funds that are managed by high street names like BlackRock, right. like J.P. Morgan, right? Um, and so the idea is pretty simple. I'm 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 putting together a basket of these trusts, and then because you know I still have a sort of niggling problem around the currency i've got a <laughs> i've got a, i've got a strategy which is really simple i'm i'm channeling my inner turtle trader and i'm going to i mean right now sterling yeah. is or cable cable is in is is in an uptrend yeah while it's in an uptrend as defined by moving averages i'll yeah. own the position unhedged the moment it's ah. in a downtrend rules based i hedge it up that's smart that's smart. Take the emotion out of it. Take the only the the one side. Yeah, uh, that's it. I like I mean, it. And, what is? And, uh, and, can you give me a symbol for like uh, one of these closed end funds? Yeah, just one of them. I so, just... so, so, I mean, the biggest of the um, of of the group that I'm looking for is the Aberforth Smaller Companies Trust, and the ticker is ASL. ASL the and, and then LN. And that's like an ASL LN. Okay, let's have a look at this thing here, and then can I? Let's see if Bloomberg gives me a nav. It does. So it's gone from 15 to 10. So people are starting to make, wake up or is that you putting on your position? 15% <laughs> discount to 10. No, no. Listen, it's, it's, it's all it's, – so, so that they've had a real boost in the last few weeks and a lot of it is related to, well, everyone getting perky around risk assets again. But right. a lot of it is related to Weinstein, right? Oh, okay. He's, it, he's parked his tanks on the lawn of – a handful of these trusts and let's be very clear i'm you know this trade is not trying to ride the tails of the saba trade i think it's helpful at the margin yeah i just think that these assets have got cheap enough that you can own them for a, you know a long period of time and close your eyes yeah no i think that's a great trade actually and uh, what better way than to get a little extra boost Buying it at a yeah. discount. Yeah, view, view, view. I mean, he's taking a totally purist approach to this. So he, yeah, is, he just wants to uh, them to turn it hedging. into an open end trust. Like yeah, he doesn't care. I think if he's the, hedging. If, he's hedging so, the underlyings. Right. So, he doesn't but, care if it's like what's what's in there. It could be Beanie Babies, and if they're trading at a discount to what the Beanie Babies are worth, he'll he'll buy it and and try to figure out a way to close the discount. Absolutely, he's doing it completely market neutral. Right. Um, and but I mean I, I I recognize I mean people don't read me for my small cap UK picks um, at the end of the day there are other people that do that a lot better but what I have done in preparing this report is I've done an analysis of the top ten holdings of all six funds and see where there's common out you can see where there's commonality of ownership and you can for those that want to genuinely get deep into the dumpster um, I'm sure there are some pretty interesting signal stock picks in there. Well, that's but awesome. Anyway, that's okay, not, so that's not really my game, yeah. right? Um, so, why don't you tell people about your letter? Um, by the way, I was listening, uh, preparing for this. I was listening to your podcast, and you, uh, what is that weekly? And it's just, yeah, it's no, unbelievable. I, I, it's I just, it's really well it. done, Rupert. <laughs> Thanks, Kev. <laughs> I, I really you. enjoyed it. I was like, oh, this is going to be my new like uh, weekend uh, listing. When when does that come out? So what I do is I send out on Monday morning Melbourne time, so Sunday evening Eastern time, my weekly note. Now, the front section of that um, is a free letter, and I will write. So this week I was writing about the Adavinter LBO. Right. And then the second second section of that, which is for paid subscribers, but in the same letter, um, I talk about my in individual trade ideas, the, which I call acorns. Um the acorns themselves come with their own reports. So this UK idea I'll be putting out over the next 24 hours. Um, and then my 
paid subscribers also have access to the Dre, which is my Discord server, which is a lot of fun. Oh, wow. The Discord server, the podcast, the letter. Oh, the podcast is free. The podcast really Everyone can get the podcast. Everyone can get it. It's on Apple. It's on Spotify. There we go. Just look up Blind Squirrel Macro. And um, essentially, it's the audio version of the front section of the letter that I put out on Monday. Well, well, that's awesome. So for those who are interested, just to repeat, the letter is free. So if you want to read uh, Rupert on a regular basis... You can go to blindsquirrelmacro.substack.com if I got it right. Well, no, no. It's just blindsquirrelmacro.com. I actually forked out. For oh, you did it. I'm proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> I was so really, I'm, you know, a, I'm, I'm also on Twitter. I'm at Squirrel Macro on Twitter. Um, we, I'm reasonably active on there. But, um, you know, I'm also active on your chat, Kev. And, oh, um, you are. You I, know, we always appreciate hearing from you on there. And, um, and, then I and have make sure you guys tune members. in for the podcast, the Blind Squirrel Macro Podcast. I really enjoy it. Uh, there's not enough Thank beers, you. but otherwise it's great. Mate, it's, it's definitely a coffee time of day on Tuesday morning for me. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing those a couple of great ideas with us, Rupert. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Thanks, Kev. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to this Market Huddle Plus episode. And don't forget that our regular full-length show airs every second weekend. This Friday, we're looking forward to chatting with Jonathan Lansky, the author of No Straight Lines Investments. In the meantime, you can check out my partner, Patrick Serezna's website at bigpicturetrading.com. And if you want to see what I'm up to, go to themacrotourist.com. Until next time, I'm Kevin Muir, and thanks for listening.